All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Matt Kozlowski. I'm the VP of Professional Services over at Winslow. Um, we're really excited today um, in kind of our monthly, um, you know, reoccurring security, uh, you know, webinar to, uh, to have Mark Keating from Arctic Wolf join us today um, and uh, Peter Stone from Mimecast join us today. So uh, today, um, we're just going to do a little overview of uh, Winslow, and then we're going to get to the uh, the heart of the matter. Um, so Mark and, uh, and Peter um, are going to present the current state of kind of modern email security. So it's going to be a really great overview of um, current threats that are out there, uh, what you can do about it, um, and then some really um, interesting like advanced techniques for protect uh, protecting and detecting, um, you know, those, those types of threats. Um, at the end, we'll have a Q&A. Um, you can use the chat uh, in the uh, the GoToWebinar portal um, to, uh, to to put out any questions there. And uh, of course, last but not least, uh, we are excited uh, that today we'll be giving away a $100 food delivery gift card to uh, to a lucky winner. Um, and we have some instructions on uh, on how that will uh, will happen as well. So um, there's some uh, audience or um, uh, attendee participation, um, you know, involvement for that. So just a little bit about uh, Winslow Technology Group. So um, we are headquartered in Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, we have an office in New York City and one in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Um, we span the entire spectrum of desktops and data center solutions through services and security and even cloud. Um, our approach is really to identify uh, what we consider game-changing technologies and Arctic Wolf and Mimecast uh, definitely fall into that category that really um, you know, provide you know, a high value, high touch, you know, um, high customer stat um, experience, both you know from from customer engagement all the way through technical, um, and in the case of AWN and Mimecast, really protecting um, and defending um, your uh, your environment. So you know how does this fit into WTG's uh, cybersecurity kind of product overlay? And I'm going to apologize for the eye chart version of this. There's a lot going on here, um, but here at, at WTG uh, we use the NIST cybersecurity framework core um, to deliver um, what we consider an organized, comprehensive, and really cost-effective um, cybersecurity program um, really to, uh, to an organization of any size. So those five uh, families or functions are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, and we have a product or solution or a combination of a product and solution that really spans that entire spectrum. Um, so if you look uh, kind of towards the middle top of said I chart, uh, you'll see like SMTP email, um, so full targeted threat protection. That's uh, that's one of the technologies we're going to talk a little bit about today. And then towards the bottom where you see managed risk and managed detection and response, that's the, uh, the uh, kind of Arctic Wolf component of it. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Uh, Mark, do you want to want to dive in and talk a little bit about uh, and frame up our discussion with uh, with Mimecast today in Arctic Wolf? Yeah, sure thing, Matt. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Mark. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Keating uh, here with Arctic Wolf. Uh, I'm also uh, joined today by Peter Stone uh, from Mimecast. So, Peter, say hi to everyone. Good morning, folks. Awesome. And today we're going to be talking a bit about. Um, the state of what's going on uh, in the world of how to identify cyber attacks. Um, once we go through and do that, uh, we'll go through and talk a bit about how to design a defense against those kind of attacks. So we'll be taking the latest things that we're seeing out there, letting you know what they are, um, taking a next step into what that means from an email protection perspective, uh, and then what happens when you know attackers get through those protections and actually go into it and figuring out how you know um, if someone's gotten through and then what to do about it. And at the end. I will bring it back to Matt, and there'll be a, a kind of a follow-up uh, from this webcast. If you have any questions uh, during the webcast, uh, just from a housekeeping perspective, uh, please go ahead and click in the questions tab. You can ask them there. Um, also, um, we will be doing a – do I have control here? I think I do. So how do I hit next? There we go. Perfect. Awesome. A giveaway. That's what I just wanted to kind of get to. So the way this is going to work um, is throughout the presentation, there will be some questions. Uh, what will happen is you, when you see the question, uh, you'll type your answer in the chat section of the webinar. Um, so you just type it in there. Uh, and the first person with the correct or closest answer, again, depending on what the question is, uh, will go ahead and get the, that question correct. 
Um, the last question is a tiebreaker for the people who got the first four questions right. So you'll see as we go through this, uh, there'll be a set of questions. Uh, and then the winner will decide, will contact them afterwards and you'll have your choice. You can choose a $100 gift card uh, from Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, whatever works best in your environment. Um, and then you can feed your family, get a couple meals for yourself, depending on you know if it's you or your, your spouse and you uh, with kids, whatever it works. So that's how the contest is gonna work. Uh, Peter, anything you wanted to add on to that? There are no wrong answers, but uh, this is a speed test as well. So be sure to keep in mind that the first correct answer is the winner of that query. Excellent. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, let me just move this forward. So speaking of that, uh, we're gonna kick this right off with the first question. Peter, you wanna go ahead and read that out? Yes, of course, Mark, thank you so much. So the first question for everybody on the call today is what is the average time to identify and remediate cyber attacks? Now remember, the, the idea of this is the fastest answer and the closest to accurate wins. Uh, so we'll give you a few seconds uh, to go out here, think about your answer, uh, please type it into the chat window. Uh, so we'll see that and then we'll go ahead and bring the answer up in a moment. Um, so just trying to get a little bit of uh, knowledge out to you guys. So um, there's a lot of different discussions around how this works. Uh, so we see a couple answers coming in. We'll go ahead and give it a few more uh, seconds to wait for those to come in. And once that happens, we'll go ahead and talk a bit about uh, how we get to that number and what that looks like. Okay, Peter, what do you think? You think we're ready? We wanna move on. We wanna give it another more second or two. I'd say let's give them just a few more seconds to get those stragglers in there. We're looking for a time period. So it could be minutes, it could be hours, it could be days, it could be months. You, you quantify that, uh, that value, but please let us know and we will advance. Once we advance this slide, uh, answers will no longer be accepted. Okay. Peter's a pretty tough taskmaster with his rules there. So, you know, I, uh, so I wanted to give him, this is his first question. So I figured I'd give him the rules on how he wanted it to go. So not a problem. All right, oh, yeah. so we'll give another couple oh, of seconds, yeah. uh, get the last couple of answers in there. And uh, whenever you think we're ready, All Pete. Right. All right, well, I can't actually see any answers in the chat window, so I don't know <laughs> if people are responding or not, but I hope somebody else could see that because we're moving on here. Uh, the average number of uh, days to identify and remediate a cybersecurity threat or breach is 314 days. That is correct. It's almost a full year. Uh, the majority of that time is spent identifying that there is a problem. And then, of course, it takes a long time to uh, contain and understand uh, what that problem uh, exposed the business to as well as remediate it. So one of the things that we see, and Pete, this is actually true of both of our companies, um, because you know this is something that you and I are both seeing, um, is today out there, there are a ton, a ton of them. And you can just Google any, any mail source you like, um, you'll see, and this actually came from Mimecast, um, and we've seen the same thing at Arctic Wolf, um, is we're seeing a lot of different attempts to take advantage of the current you know, COVID-19 environment. Uh, there's a bunch of different phishing emails uh, that are out there. In fact, Pete, do you want to talk about the 10-second the, the version of how you guys identified this? Because uh, you've seen this out there in the wild, right? Yes, of course. We have seen a number of different campaigns that reference the, the current pandemic, and that is not surprising to us. Uh, the techniques that attackers utilize to uh, uh, infiltrate or otherwise trick your users into doing something they shouldn't Typically, the techniques don't change time, uh, time over time. Of course, there's novel vectors that arise in the, the grand scheme of things. But what does change is they reskin those techniques with whatever is top of mind for the moment. So, of course, right now it's COVID and everybody's probably a little jaded by hearing that. Uh, but, you know, around tax time, it's, hey, click here for your tax returns. Around Christmas time, it's, uh, check here for your tracking for your package that somebody just sent you. Uh, it's really all a, a, a ploy to get the user to click on that link, open that attachment, uh, or otherwise do something that they shouldn't have done or uh, by circumventing a certain process they should have followed. 
Yeah. Now, we just want to mention one thing. Um, we actually did get a bunch of answers in the chat window. The reason Peter and I are not seeing them is because we're presenting right now. So um, thank you guys for all the people that did answer that. Uh, and so having said that, right, um, the next question is, what is the first stage in designing your cyber defense? Because the next thing you want to do is, okay, so people are attacking me, right? Let's talk a bit about, and again, there's a lot of different ways. To Peter's point, right? It's a lot of reskinning of the same attack vectors. So how do I design a defense against that? What is that first step in actually going through and doing that, right? Um, you know, Peter, you and I have been talking about this for quite some time around, you know, how you can build multiple layers of defense. And there's going to be multiple layers to this, right? I mean, did you want to add something onto that? Certainly. I think every organization needs to do as much as they can to design their own resilience. And that involves stacking the deck in their favor with as many layers as possible. Um, and it all begins in the first stage in, in design and, and process. So uh, this one is less uh, objective, I'd say, as far as a, a figure or a number. But uh, I'm interested to see what people respond with. Yeah, me too. You know, as soon as we're over, we'll actually get to see that because I realize because we're presenting, we can't see it. So, Jordan, thank you for letting us know that we're, uh, we got some folks on the back end who are letting us know the answers are coming in. So that's fantastic. So we're going to go ahead and close this question out and move on. Um, and so the, uh, the first stage is to actually identify the assets that you have. So Matt mentioned earlier uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework. So the best way to design your defense is to use a framework. Now, NIST is one of the ones that's uh, most common out there. There are others. You can use ISO 27001. Uh, you can map yourself to the CIS security controls. You can use the NIST cybersecurity framework. But if you start from a framework, the idea is you're not just going to go out and buy point products here and there without a comprehensive strategy to understand where your gaps are and figure it out. What you want to do is look at a framework and then plan your cyber defenses from that. So with NIST, as Matt had mentioned, there's five pillars of NIST. It really starts with identifying uh, what you have, uh, moving into protecting those assets. Then once you've done that, you figure out detecting if things are working, if they're not working, <clears throat> if someone has gotten through those defenses, figure out how you respond to that breach. So if something does actually get through, you figure out how you respond to it. And then once you've responded, so you've kind of contained it and stopped the threat, now you have to recover from that and get your business running up again. So the concept of fitting in defenses here from a framework really kind of leads us into, all right, so now that I've identified what I have, right, let's talk a bit about email being one of the attack vectors. So Pete, you want to talk a bit about how this, you know, as, as a step in the identification process works? Sure, of course. So the, the first, first part of the NIST framework is to identify what you've got. Uh, of course, every organization in the world has email because it is the number one communication channel now for our uh, 2020 life, uh, especially when we're all working remotely. Uh, and with that being said, it is basically the front door to your office now. So just like any other avenue of infiltration, the highest risk vector is typically the one you want to stack the most layers of defense around. You want to put the most investment on defending against that front door. Uh, because most of the time people aren't just going to bulldoze down through the concrete wall. Uh, and that being said, over 90% of cyber attacks today leverage email as that delivery vector. So you want to ensure that whatever solution you're looking for, and this is just an example of uh, what our current layered defense looks like for email-based attacks, you want to ensure that it matches that attack uh, landscape. Now, attackers don't stand still. They are continuing to iterate and evolve. Of course, we're talking about reskinning their techniques with whatever the flavor of the month is, but they also generate new types of attacks. You know, a new ransomware family may come up. Uh, and everybody knows about BEC and, and uh, wire fraud, but about three or four years ago, that was something that was unknown and not utilized. So you want to ensure that whatever solutions you use can evolve rapidly to deal with those new threats because attackers are iterating just as rapidly. All right. So speaking of that, right, you know, um, I think, Peter, I think this one is actually your question, right? So do you want to go ahead and uh, read that out while we're going to ask people to answer it? Sure. Yeah, I'll read it out. Uh, what is the percentage of threats and data leaks that start with an employee or potentially referred to as human error? Yeah, now, now I just want to remind folks that this is going to be a percentage. So try to get as close to the right percentage as possible. 
Um, so we'll show you that answer on the next slide. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is a topic I mean, that comes up a whole lot, right, Pete? I mean, there's you can do all the technology in the world, but there's definitely the people factor that you shouldn't forget about with this. Correct. And we are not doing a closest without going over. It's just the closest. So don't don't try and underbid <laughs> like the price is right here. Uh, but it should be a number between one and a hundred. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I definitely think if you go over 100, you're probably going to get it wrong. That's probably a good hint. Um, yeah, so, probably. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I did love the show, The Price is Right, though. I got to tell you, right? That, that was a great show, right? People would go like $1 and then somebody bid $2 on top of it to like get that guy out, you know? So there's a lot of strategy involved in that show, right? But uh, of course, it was like silly, stupid fun at what, 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. You know, I forget when they aired it, but that was, that was a pretty fun show back in the day. So. All right, I think we've uh, let that go on. What do you think, Pete? Time to move on? Time to move on. So drum roll, please. The percentage right. of threats at data leaks that start with a employee is 86% based on public and third-party research. Now, 90% of security inf incidents involve human error. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means that you can have all the security layers in the world keeping your users safe and guiding them through following the right process. But if your users don't pay attention or they don't adhere to those processes, then there's still going to be problems. So we like to refer to the user base or uh, our employees here at Mindcast as the human firewall. They are our last line of defense to prevent an attack on them. Unfortunately, that human firewall isn't as sophisticated as all the digital and technological firewalls and security controls we can put in place because humans aren't very good at identifying those digital threats. So, now, 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 Pete, i got to ask, so, right? is that your on the right-hand side there? Because I think you have one of those, right? I do have one of those T-shirts. Uh, that is not me, just in case you're wondering, although it does look like a lot of our dress codes now that we're all remote. Um, that being said, uh, it's all about users following the guidance and using their best judgment. And unfortunately, they're not always thinking about their security presence and behavior when they're acting. Uh, and why is that? Well, we're investing. Organizations around the US are investing over a billion and a half dollars a year on training their users for uh, what to look out for, why it's important. However, it doesn't seem to resonate. You know, even, even recent studies show that over half, 64% of employees are unenthusiastic about taking that training kind of feels more like detention than it does uh, recess, so to speak. And why is that? Well, users are kind of lazy, right? Not lazy in the sense that they don't want to do their job, but they don't necessarily want to step out of the bounds of their job and, and think about something that they think is unrelated to their work. Uh, and that's an engagement problem. You know, a, a user says, why is it my problem to, to study, you know, what a phishing email looks like or or why I should validate this request and not get socially engineered. So maybe the training doesn't resonate. And that's something that Mindcast feels is a fundamental problem with most security solutions. They don't factor in the human experience. Uh, so with any technological solution, there should always be a thought and a component of it of how do we keep the users informed and educated on why these controls are necessary and why we can't circumvent them. Uh, and, that's, and that's really uh, an uphill battle because we've neglected them typically for a long time and kept them in the dark. Now, Mark, uh, the, the next aspect of this is just an example of one type of attack surface, so to speak, and how uh, we fold in that user education and user uh, training into the model. So think about an email that comes in with a phishing link in it, right? And of course, any security solution in the world is going to try and keep that, that data out of the environment, but we all know that there's always that one chance that it gets in, and that's why Arctic Wolf is a very important part of your uh, layered defense as well. So when that email comes in, your user has an option. They can click on that link, or they could uh, not click on that link, or potentially report that to security. Now, if they click on that link, that's where the security event becomes something for the SOC team to remediate and all that. If they never click on a link, then they never got infected. So when they click on a link, it might be important to educate them or remind them that, hey, this 
this link came from an outside source. It, it looked a little funny. Did you think about what you were doing? To give them a chance to understand why their process might be flawed and to help them understand what those techniques look like so that they can avoid clicking on links in the future, all while keeping them safe from visiting that site. No, I, Mark, I totally... is there anything you wanted to add on, on this process and, and how how the user experience should change based on the way it is today? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good point, Pete, right? You know, I, th I think one of the most important things is to reduce as much as possible Right, you know, the chances of bad things happening. And, you know, having this kind of technology, this kind of capability is very important because despite all of our best efforts, right, no matter how much we train and educate and work with people, you need to build in layers, right, to assist them, right, to make things easier. Because most folks, when they think about their job, they think about, you know, whatever it is, I deal with spreadsheets, I sell, I you know do financial reports. I do the back end for Salesforce.com. Whatever my job is, I, I code. I, I write programs. Right. What they're not focused on is oh, this email looks like it's from Bob. So let me think about this for a second before I should click because it looks pretty real. Most people, all day every day, don't think about that. So Pete, exactly what you just said, right? You know, training and awareness, keeping them engaged, right, and then layering on some of these protections is hugely important. And what this does, it reduces the chances of things getting through. Would you agree with that? 100%. And just as an example, for all the people on this webinar, we're kind of using those techniques on you. The gamification, the, the quizzes, the, the questions, the prizes. That's getting you engaged, whether you realize it or not. And that's the entire idea around getting them engaged with security as well. Make it fun, make it exciting, you know, throw some memes in there. Yeah. Make it relatable. That way it's not just a chore anymore. It's, it's something to be proud of and something to be excited about, a breakup from the mon monotony of their normal day. Absolutely. And, and, and speaking of that, right, you know, so let's say we've done all those things, right, you know, and again, right, you know, you've reduced your chances, you've done all that. How do you know, right, if a threat has breached your defenses? So this is a, you know, write your best answer uh, in the chat window. Um, again, we'll give you a couple of minutes uh, or, you know, a minute or so to go ahead and write your answer in. Um, you know, so this one, the idea behind this question is to come as close as you can to the concept of how you know, right? So it, it's important to understand that as you build layers of defense, like we've been talking about before, right? Part of it is tools, part of it is training, part of it is, you know, watching everything out there, right? Like we talked about earlier. So Take a minute, answer this question. Uh, Pete, anything you wanted to add on really briefly on that? Uh, around identifying breaches of the defenses, uh, there are a number of different anomalies that can be identified. Of course, the user reports are, are something that doesn't always come uh, because sometimes users are timid to report things. They think they'll be in trouble if they actually admit that they did something they shouldn't have, even if they know something's wrong. So empowering them to feel confident in, in, in doing that and using their voice as well as having the systems in place to do that detection behind the scenes are all part of this same model. Yeah, so, so I guess we just popped the answer up here. Sorry, my fault. We clicked the, the, the button by mistake there. So I, I accidentally put the answer up on the screen, which is to monitor and scan everything. So hopefully uh, you get your answer in before that. Um, that's really the whole key to this, right? So the whole key to understanding, right, whether or not you've been breached is to identify, right, you know, and watch what's happening. So once once you've got some layers in defense, now you wanna watch those layers. This is the belt and suspenders approach of, you know, watching to make sure the layers are working, fine tuning them, updating them. It's kind of a feedback loop if you think about it that way. And while there's a lot going on on this slide, if you take the summary away, is you wanna watch everything, your on-prem infrastructure, so all the stuff on the left-hand side, your switches, your, your firewalls, your wireless access points, whatever technology you're using, you want to make sure you watch that. Don't forget about your cloud environments. So, you know, you want to integrate, you know, things like Mimecast on the front end to your email and office suites and any cloud environments that you have. Again, lots of different layers you're putting in here. Make sure you take those feeds in and don't forget about your endpoints. Everyone's working from home these days, so make sure that, you know, you're bringing in the feeds, all of the data that you can from your endpoints. So people connect from their endpoints to their cloud environment, to your on-prem environment, VPN. So as they're doing all of these things, it's more important than ever to make sure that you watch 
every aspect of your environment. When we talk about watching every aspect of your environment, what we mean by that is, um, you know, it's, it's more than just collecting the logs, right? So it's one thing to just sit here and collect the logs, right? The idea is to have a business outcome from your security operations center. And this is true whether you do this yourself or partner with a company like Arctic Wolf to do it for you, the concepts are the same. You start with collecting all your data, right? So you ingest all of your raw data, bring it in from across all your sources, on-prem, off-prem, cloud-based, you wanna make sure you keep updated threat intelligence feeds to stay on top of the latest intelligence so that you can adjust in real time or as close to real time as possible to the latest threats. Once you've done that, you wanna make sure you actually go through the data. This is difficult, right? Because there's a ton of noise in that data. Bob logged in from his laptop. Guess what you see the next day? Bob logged in from his laptop. Bob logged in from his laptop on Friday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. This can get really boring really fast. Um, or if you're doing this part-time, you might get dragged off onto something else because you've seen Bob log into his laptop 5 million times. And the one time it looks like Bob logging in, you might miss it. So the whole key to this is you're filtering through this and make those filters efficient to do that, right? Now, making the business outcome out of that, which is I want to know if something bad is happening, involves analyzing this to deliver useful information. So the whole key to success here is once you've got the information and you've parsed through it and you've made your filters and you've made your rules, you actually have to go through and correlate across all your different sources, your logs from your Office 365 and your Mindcast and your on-prem environments and your switches and your wireless access points and your laptops. And what that lets you tell is, oh, it was Bob. He logged in from his laptop. He clicked on this link in an email and did the following things, or it looked like Bob. It really wasn't Bob who logged in. That's how you tell the difference. Right? So the whole point is to look across all those sources, and then you can start to tell the story of what happened. When you get more proactive, the idea is to scan everything, right? Scan your perimeter, your domains, your subdomains, look on the dark web for data, you know, look outside your environment, see if there's holes in your firewalls, if your websites have issues with like cross-site scripting attacks, those kind of things. Make sure you scan inside your environment. Again, do this 24-7, 365, or as often as you possibly can, right? Take a look at unauthorized devices, people plugging in Wi-Fi hotspots, right? The more of this you do, the more you'll be able to identify quickly what's going on and then get a remediation action in place. Right? If you don't know what's happening, you can't understand what to do about it. Everyone's working from home, as we've talked about before. Don't forget about your endpoints. Right? And again, bringing all this data together into a single environment makes this easier, right? Lots of things you can do. Last thing I'll mention is if you benchmark, again, this goes to building a framework. If you benchmark all of your assets, on-prem, off-prem, you can know where to start and then build your plan as to what to do about it. This is what we do, Arctic Wolf. We can do this on your behalf. We can scan everything with our managed risk service. We can monitor everything with our managed detection response service. Again, whether you do this with us or whether you do it yourself with tools in-house, the concepts are the same. So I just wanna kind of leave you with that. Um, and I want to, Peter and I will talk a bit through the summary here. So Pete, do you want to talk a bit about, you know, tools and leveraging the tools and the kind of the first couple of bullets here? And we'll kind of do this together, if that makes sense. Certainly, right. So uh, when it comes to tools around email security, of course, every organization should be running some type of uh, anti-spam and antivirus layer. But that is really about a decade old mindset now as well. Uh, every modern day email security platform also includes sandboxing for zero day and, and macro or polymorphic based attacks. Uh, some type of BEC detection that again correlates data in those threats versus your intellectual property. Things like comparing display names to your user base in AD. Uh, that's the type of glue that it takes to defend against these sophisticated style of attacks. Um, but of course, it's not just about email at the gateway. It's also about always on detection for internal attacks, uh, phishing links that maybe weren't phishing links when they were first in an email, all of that type of stuff that really needs to be a cohesive and real time based defensive tool set. Yeah, and then, and then when you start leveraging that, the whole key is once you've got your tools in place, once you've got your defenses and you've kind of got your layers built out, the next step is to watch everything and scan everything. And the whole key to success here is do this as often as possible as, as with everything that you can. If you just watch part of your environment or just scan part of your environment, that's a hole where the bad guys are gonna get through. It's just, they have such a financial motivation to get through there. If you're not watching everything, if you think that you can just watch part of your environment, I would ask that you please rethink that strategy um, and how you do that. Now the whole, the whole key to success out of this is if you do all of these things, 
you have your tools, you're watching things, you do all of that. The last two bullets, you please do them. If you're gonna invest this far and go this far with it, please make sure you're figuring out what is important by triaging um, and then do something about what you find. Because if you do all the top five bullets, you know, and you get everything right through that, and then as an organization, you are not empowered to take remediation action to actually do something about it, then I'm not sure why you're doing this. So Pete, anything you wanted to add on to that? Certainly, yeah, of course, being empowered to actually act when you uh, find these events is very important and it can be slightly demotivating if you're not empowered to do that, just like <laughs> empowering the users. The, uh, the IT and SOC teams also should be empowered to have that capability. Uh, some things can be automated in process and protocols, so automatic remediation, for example, uh, if threats are detected, without need to respond or without need to act by the team, uh, it makes it easier for you to get that uh, done. And it also makes it easier once you get the approvals to to really kind of say, I've already been granted the responsibility to do this, and the systems are in place to automate that response as much as possible. Of course, iterating and evolving that is something that we can both help uh, with as well. Yeah, and, and that involves everything around, you know, updating your tools, updating your rule sets, updating what you watch, updating how you scan. So the whole feedback loop is to make sure that, you know, when we talk about doing something and taking action, right, it's to make sure that that includes updating what you have, watching what you have, and doing all that. So on that note, um, Matt, we're going to turn this back over to you um, to kind of, you know, okay. take it home and finish things up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark and Peter. You know, um, guys, like, feel, feel free to chime in too, but there were a couple things that I took away from this. So first, right, um, was the whole notion of this being like a modern uh, thing to do versus just like, like Peter, you just said it like 10 years ago, you know, we were doing like just basic spam filtering and then we got a little, um, you know, more intelligent around it. But this really is like what we're talking about now is like definitely a leap uh, forward beyond just spam filtering with all the threat intelligence feeds, kind of the, the URL rewriting sandbox, like all these different techniques that we have to protect people. Um, uh, another thing that um, that Winslow, like we've actually seen this in the wild uh, quite a bit, and this is, you know, one of these complicated attacks that kind of all these solutions together um, really, really help out with, and that's like business email compromise. And one of the biggest kind of flavors that we see of that is where, um, you know, organizations will get fished, uh, you know, and someone ends up giving up their password. Um, and then the attackers will actually go in through like, you know, the OWA, like the web interface, create uh, forwarding rules. Um, and now like an attacker is receiving like, you know, forwarded copies of email. So like it's, it's, it's definitely more than just spam protecting. It's like detecting like forwarding rules were created or like the behavioral presence of that. Um, that's, that's huge in the notion of uh, business email compromise protection. And then but just to add on there, um, uh, Matt, yeah, yeah. Just, to add, just to add on there, we've done studies that identify, and speaking to that, you know, old guard mentality versus modern, uh, traditionally, you know, you put all your security at the, at the perimeter, you know, a walled garden, so to speak, and that's what e traditional email security was. Anything coming in from the outside world or going out, and historically not many people looked at their outbound traffic, but if you're just focused on the perimeter from an email-only perspective, you're only evaluating and monitoring 40% of your email traffic. 60% wow. of that of emails generated in an organization are internal. So if an attacker gains access to a mailbox and they start targeting the other users, it's important to have visibility, detection, and protection around threats that typically are out of view if you're doing the traditional mindset design. You know, um, that's like a really great point. And I, I feel like in this case, we talked a bunch about, um, you know, bad things that could happen in terms of like infection and uh, just, just general phishing. But when we talk about really serious like data breaches where confidential um, information uh, is released, like that's coming from the inside out. So Peter, I think you're spot on there too, um, in terms of like missing things, if you're only protecting uh, things coming in, not just uh, things going out. So um yeah, and then uh, Mark, you you also talked about um, awareness training. So you know, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, we all were like, oh, everyone needs to do cybersecurity awareness training. This is going to be huge. Everyone's going to love it. Uh, well, we still do it, and it's still like a really important part of a program and an overall strategy. But I would say, um, I, I think like peers agree too. Like we just don't like 
uh, trust people enough to make these decisions. So um, it is important to have like systems in place um, that augment any of the um, the kind of like uh, uh, you know cybersecurity awareness training programs that that people have in place. And um, since email is like the number one kind of attack surface. Um, for this type of stuff, like really focusing on protecting what's coming in and what's going out would seem to be um, like a really important area for uh, for people to concentrate on. Yeah, no, I know I couldn't agree more, Matt. You know, I think that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different, you know, vectors to take a look at, but email is such a, we all have email, we all use it every day, right? You know, and the more layers you can put in to assist your users who are focused on their other jobs, um, the better that this will work. Yeah, it's all. It's so, also key to identify the the risk of your users, right? So uh, we talk about identifying what you've got. Well, your employees are one of your biggest uh, resources and one of your biggest uh, you know value adds, but they're not all created equal when it comes to this stuff. So being able to evaluate and identify which users act with more with more risky behavior than others and what their exposure is to sensitive information inside the business can help you design the uh, the process, the procedures, the oversight over uh, that risk. Matt, it looks like you got a tricky question up here. I did, I did. I this was this is like the tiebreaker question. So uh, you know, when we were putting this together, we're like, we gotta we gotta figure out some something uh, you know, that that's a little tiebreaker like. So um, I actually gave people like a sneak peek because I advanced it on a little too quickly, I think. So um, basically, uh, so the, the kind of tiebreaker, like the final question that we have here for uh, for the giveaway is, uh, what is the name of the exploit used in the WannaCry ransomware attack of 2017? Oof. And, uh, yeah. and Mark, I'd like to see... Uh, call on me. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think call on me. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not giving away any answers. <laughs> it's too bad all it's right. almost lunch time and now i'm getting hungry it's like wait a second like wait a minute here right, right? <laughs> all right so um that the name of that uh that wanna cry uh the exploit used was uh, eternal blue kind of a fascinating um situation if you just like read through what it ha happened how the whole thing played out and like even the involvement in like the, the u.s uh, the federal government and everything there so um cool Cool stuff to take a look back at. Um, all right, so kind of just to really wrap things up, um, I do want to offer um, like a, basically a call to action, if you will. Um, WTG uh, has a, a, a no-cost um, cybersecurity framework assessment. So um, in about 60 minutes, um, we'll ask you a bunch of questions that revolve around you know identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, and we'll give you some ideas around where uh, where we think um, you could enhance like your security. Um, and uh, and uh, posture. So, um, with that, um, we only have a couple minutes left, but I do um, I do want to say like next month's webinar um, is uh, May thirteenth at eleven thirty. Uh, we're going to talk about cybersecurity using the CIS controls, and um, and that one too. Um, obviously, we'll um, we'll touch on uh, a little bit more there, um, including um, email. Um, if you're interested in that no cost uh, secure score assessment, feel free to uh, email uh, webinars at winslowtg.com, and uh, and we'll get you set up with one. Um, we have a couple minutes left, so I'll open it up to uh, to any uh, Q and A. <clears throat> okay, so so Matt, the way they should ask questions is what in the Q and A tab in the oh yeah in the chat panel? yep in the uh, in the chat yep yep or or do you want it in the Q and A panel? Which way do you want it? Uh, I guess like e either way, whatever, whatever is visible and easiest for uh, for the users <laughs> for the attendees. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I think um, I think we'll be able to see the Q and A because I know we suppressed the chat just based on us presenting. So I think you and I should and Peter should be able to see the Q and A. So if you have any questions, uh, click into the the questions tab uh, on the right hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel, and you should be able to ask your question there, and we'll go ahead and address that. I learned that about twenty minutes ago when Jordan let us know that Matt. So that uh, just figure that out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's the only reason I even know this. <laughs> so thank you, Jordan, for letting us know that. Just by way of background, I should probably explain who Jordan is since I mentioned her name a couple times. She's just helping us out on the back end here. Uh, so she's been incredibly yeah. helpful in setting this up. So yeah. uh, we really appreciate all the work that you did on this, Jordan. So I know you're kind of on silent there, but uh, thank you again.
Yeah, of course. Um, there's no questions for thus far, by the way, guys. Okay. That's, that's, that's fine. So, you know, if um, any, any, any attendees like uh, think of something, have a question to follow up, just feel free to shoot um, an email over to that webinars at winslowtg.com um, address. Um, with that, you know, on behalf of uh, Mark, Peter, Jordan, WTG, um, Mimecast, Arctic Wolf, sincere thank you uh, for taking time out of your day um, to attend this and, and hear us out. We hope it was, we hope it was valuable. Um, if you have any feedback, feel free to share that um, with us as well. And with that, I'll say, uh, stay, uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, uh, be well, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, guys.